so let me take a call. So it's different. Thank you for coming out. My name is Jizzo, you all don't know. AKA Genius from the Wu Tang Clan. And I must say it's an honor to be here lecturing today at Harvard University. Thank you. I would like to thank a few people before I get started. Don, right here, Sanoki. From the Harvest Black Men's Forum. I would like to thank Alvin Carter from the Harvard Hip Hop Archives, John Wren and his team, Broad Institute, Institution, Eric Landon, Phil Richardson, Penny Chisholm, David Kaiser, Tom Makova or Makova? Makova. <laughs> Ethan Zuckerman, big up Facebook. <laughs> My homeboy Juno, Diaz, Pagan Kennedy, Mary Carmichael. Thanks for having me here. Thank you.
she would show me how to play. You know, one of the first songs she showed me was a gospel song. She also thought that I should take lessons, and she insisted on it, and she would pay for it. But I had another cousin, a female cousin, who taught me out of it. He said it was a sissy thing. She <laughs> <laughs> was a teenager playing the piano, so I kind of, she convinced me. And to this day, I wish, you know, I regret not taking the lessons. Another reason I used to go to my aunt's house all the time, and um, she had this album, the last poet album. Familiar with the last poets, right? She had this last poet album, and they had this dude that was just flowing on there. This great poetry that just pulled me in. They had these bombos and all this stuff playing in the back. But um, one of the reasons that I used to like to listen to the album because it had so much profanity on it. <laughs> <laughs> so I would go to her house and I'd go in the living room and I'd listen to it. These songs, and they also had the lyrics inside the, the, the sleeve, right? And I would read them all while I was listening to this music. I don't actually, I don't even think my aunt ever heard this album. That she, had, she wouldn't have let me listen to it. Anyway. <laughs> so, um, throughout my early years at MC, you know, I was part of several groups. You know, I started at a very young age. I was part of several groups. One was called Mission Impossible. With a homeboy of mine, his name was Jackpot. He was called Scotty Watt back then. He actually told me to this day, you know, how he told me how we met. He said we met in the library, reaching for the same book. <laughs> I don't remember that though. <laughs> but, um, And then we formed all in together now for Dirty Years of Mention and several songs. We formed the all in together now crew. That was around 1984. Rizza, he was a scientist. Dirty was a specialist. And they gave me the name Genius. I never wanted that title. <laughs> because I, I thought people would expect too much. You know, being a genius, so. I didn't, I didn't want to lose it. You know, I can remember a time also where we did a show and we put on the fly, because Dirty was doing, he was a beatbox, and we had put on the fly the specialist, but I took his his title, the professor. He didn't like that. You know, and, uh, I didn't want to use genius because I thought too much was expected from it. Plus, it wasn't enough words that rhymed with genius.
He was desperate too. <laughs> Almost started a fight. But um, so we would make these ideas and routines together and, and practice. And somebody would ask if I ever wrote rhymes with dirty boat. Well, we each use each other rhymes, you know, kind of recycled them because we wrote lyrics together. This is some, nowadays artists don't you know they don't write together. Sometimes we do songs. And don't even meet the artist <laughs> or the person who you're getting on the song with. That's a pro tool, you know, this modern technology, things like that. So we don't really get to see the person who we're getting on the track with. But hip hop was so much part of our lives back then that we incorporated in just about every, everything we did was involved around hip hop. That's how much we loved it. You know, we would sit up all night, we would write the lyrics, we would talk about rhyme flow, and we had pretty good lyrics at the time, you know, an abundance of good lyrics. We would always strive to be clever, be witty, be intelligent at the same time, and not dumb down, you know. One of the things about ODB, well, one of the things about him is poetry, or, you know, that happens is that, you know, poetry ends with the composition, whereas rhyming, you know, continues with the record and also being by. Old B, like I said, he was a human beatbox, you know, he was a multi talented dude. Rizzo was also, they were DJs, MCs, and beatbox. I was just an MC. I tried to do what it was be. <laughs> I was kind of good with feet a little, but I used to use rollers, cups, and records to get everything straight. But Dirty was a human beatbox, and he was really good. He was one of the best that I've ever heard. And um, when we were battling with you know, these routines, and he would play these beats, and it would be so good. And the irony about it is that I used to write some of his beats. <laughs> yeah. Stand in front of him, waving my hands like I was a conductor, and, <laughs> and tell him to add a symbol. When I would actually write on paper, write down music, beats. I, I can't read music, but you know, if you looked at what I was writing, it wouldn't make sense to you. It was just like a whole bunch of crazy stuff. But I used to write these beats for him. He was a specialist, and um, he was really good at it. You know, and as Time went on, we progressed, we became better, I became better, we crafted our skills and we started trying to shop out demos and, and get a deal, which is a whole nother story. You know, the first time we went to the studio was in 1985, we did a song called True Fresh and Sea. Dirty was doing beatbox when I did the track playing, you know, it's a small studio. We were just happy to be in it. It's a small eight-track studio. Really small and hot and funky. <laughs> you know, this thing that was called the Papa Stopper. You know, I know what the Papa Stopper is. It's that net. You know, that, that net filters thing so that's in front of the microphone. Mm -hmm. I was in the lab today, you know, talking about viruses and germs. <laughs> <laughs> there was so much of that in there. But we were happy to be in here, you know, we, we, we did the song. I mean, we were rhyming before rap was on wax. So it wasn't like we, our goal or we were trying to be an MC when we got older. We just did it for the love. It was in our heart from day one. You know, nowadays a lot of kids want to be rappers because they think they can make a lot of money. They think it's a thing to do. You get girls. You know, it's cool, you have all this status and you get all this money and they don't really have the respect for the art, you know, which is not a good thing. Still had the drive. We were 
we're still determined to do it because we love to do it. Finally got a deal, got signed, you know, we put out music, and then, well, let me go back. <laughs> Six months before recording Tech Your Neck, I had just left Cold Sherman Records, and Rizzo had just left Tommy Boy Records due to lack of promotions, um, support for our, for our records. The label I was signed to was too busy too occupied trying to support their bigger acts, which is, you know, I understand that now because it is, a, it is a business. And they were also looking for a music that was kind of similar to what was out there already. That's what labels do. It's a hit. They want to follow it. And that's, that's how it is. But they were looking for something like that. And we clashed and it didn't work. And it was kind of disappointing and discouraging because we had spent so many years making demos and trying to shop out there and calling labels and sending tapes and you know, I'm sure the label had a trash room that went from the mail room to the trash room because that's, that's what they do with a lot of artists. Um, on top of that, I made a foolish move by quitting a city job that I had to take a test for and wait four years for them to hire them. <laughs> yeah, I used to work for the transit authority. Uh -oh. I was still on probation <laughs> because I had a record deal. So my head was like, you know, kind of souped up about it. And, um, so this first experience in the music industry, several months later, we tang was formed. When we recorded Into the Wu-Tang, it was in a place called Firehouse Studios in Manhattan. I mean, the place was on fire, and the bees were buzzing all over the place. It was all this energy, it was positive. The atmosphere was peaceful, and it was sound or music that was the force that grouped us together. But too much fun and excitement in a working environment is a distraction for me. I get distracted easily. I like to write alone, which probably explains why on Wu Tang Forever, I'm only doing one CD out of two. Because I spent a lot of time playing chess and ping pong. In the <laughs> I did. I remember one time Ray Kwan saying, that brothers would write rhymes like they shoot pool and you play ping pong, you have 30 albums <laughs> So, as a clan, we might collectively come up with ideas, but then I'll need to get away and formulate my approach and actually put pen to paper. Once I get inspiration, I start writing. You know, inspiration doesn't always come to me in words, but it always comes to me in living from living beings or objects. This is where I draw my inspiration from. I can get inspiration from a baby learning how to walk because the key to walking is balance. And so much of what we do in life requires balance. So just from looking at that, I can draw inspiration. I can also get inspiration because it comes as an idea. I can get it from the unique complex design of the spider web, just from looking at it. And also to know that spider web is 10, 20, 30 times stronger than steel, which some of y'all probably don't know, it makes it more inspiring to know that. So in reality, it is the spider that has inspired me, you know, because I think every being is an object within the universe is connected somehow, whether visibly or invisibly. You know? I'm not saying that in Latin. You know? From micro to macro. <laughs> <laughs> also, I think the deeper one sees into life, the wider life opens itself to one. You see that from you know, the more you study something, the more you understand it, it opens up to. I 
I think to write a story is to create a world of your own. And it is said that a world in the making can be likened to a great jigsaw puzzle whose separate parts have life and are capable of independent movement. I think these separate parts are living things. When I write a song, it's a lot like building a puzzle. Sometimes you start with a certain part or, or an image. Sometimes with the frame, sometimes a certain color. Mm -hmm. And just like when you're rhyming, you know, because rhyming for me is a visual language. You know, it's visual. And when I write, not only do I create an atmosphere, but the atmosphere is also created within me. When I write lyrics, I only write from an author's or a writer's point of view. I write as a director. I write as a cameraman. Because to me, what's audible is visible, and what's visible is audible. What I mean by that, if I say the word television, you automatically probably think plasma, flat screen. You may think of the remote control. You may also think of a program you want to see later when you get back home. If I mention the word ashtray, you automatically think of a cigarette. So that which was audible, which came out of my mouth, had became visible in your head. You know, that's something you really have no control over. That's how things, things work. But um, that's how it is to me with writing, because these things, we have an influence on each other, our thoughts and ideas, and ideas can come to you as light or it can come as sound. You can see it or you can hear it. Then you get the visuals. Some composers, they score movies from reading the script, and then some score movies from watching the film. You know, you can do it either way, but they still you get to the same destination. Sometimes I can just write straight through once I have a concept. Other times I get ideas in the middle of nowhere and I write down on the nearest piece of paper. Sometimes in the midst of writing, I'll come up with a line that may be the sixth line and not the first. This, but this is how it feels to me. This is how it's, it's coming to me. A lot of times artists write usually whatever they put down on paper is the first line. Sometimes I switch it around. Certain way to do it. I mean, I just you know, gather information and put it out there. Um, one thing I want to speak about martial arts also, you know, never teach the Wu Tang secret. Tom Ford. The Wu Tang is a, a sword style of Kung Fu. And as far as hip hop, Wu Tang is a sword style of rhyming. You see, the tongue, which we say is a sword, or symbolic to the sword, when in motion it produces wind, when you're speaking. So, like we say, when you hear whoa, 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 that's the sword spinning. And when you hear tang, that's it hitting your neck. So you <laughs> always protect that neck. <laughs>
practicing, working, writing, constantly studying. You know, um, a writer once said, told me, I don't really write a lot. I said, well, you should write every day. I have them in my head. Um, Grand Master said, you should study every day. Every day you should study chess. So this thing with martial arts became a big part of our lives from childhood up until when we would go to 42nd Street, which is Times Square, and we would spend probably two fifty or three hours to watch three movies. We'd be in there for six hours. <laughs> probably twice a week. Cutting school. <laughs> also, I, I remember this song is called Kung Fu Fight. <laughs> From the old school. It was just, so it was a way of even incorporating karate and or Kung Fu into pop culture. So that was something that just gave us an extra boost. You know, going to the flicks and then having this song. And it's like, it was incredible to have that. You know? Little boys they love action heroes, so I'm pretty sure we all grew up having a lot of heroes. So that's Bruce Lee, Jim Kelly, Jackie Chan, Jet Li, you know, so on and so on. But it, it, it kind of reminds us of when we used to battle, walking from borough to borough. I remember being in Brooklyn, and I was passing around with the best, and I would go look for him. I was battling this guy one day, I had to kill the police with him. So the police with him.
because we have this thing where everything is formatted. Oh, you need 16 bars first, hook first. You know, sometimes I do songs that have no hooks. Sometimes I do songs that have one verse. Depends on what it is. Sometimes I like to play around with words. Sometimes I like to tell stories. Sometimes I like to take names, such as this song Fame. When I say they were told not to ride in Patty's hearse and stay out of Charles' mansion. They drove Abraham's Lincoln across the Todd Bridge expansion. Willis reads a map that marks the spot showing on his left George Burns the blunt that Williams holding. <laughs> Tyra banks the money that shot the condo for. Alicia Keys is called to give him Melbourne. Mm -hmm. You know, this is how it works for me. Hip hop word play. Because this is how inspiration comes to me. I can be watching something about planets. Because the thing for me is that being an artist, you should be able to incorporate everything you do. Everything shouldn't just be about clubs and cars. You should be able to incorporate everything where it doesn't. You can teach it about learning, but it doesn't have to be, go to school, get an education. But it's the way you deliver it. So I can be, look at the planets, and then I can get an idea and incorporate it with rhyming. Where I may say, my universe it runs like clockworks forever. My words are pulled together, sudden change in the weather. The nature and the scale of events don't make sense. A storm with no warning, you're drawn in by immense gravity that's going mad. Clouds of dust and debris. Moving at colossal speeds, they're crushing them, see? Since this rap region is heavily packed with stars, internal mirror in the telescope knows the gods. From far away, we blink as a light to stroll. Great distance of space between precise globes that travel in a circular order, like the tape in your cassette recorder, filled with corporate slaughter. So, <laughs> it's just a way of, of because, like I said, I mean, I'm not a big, you know, I'm not a sports person at all. I don't really care for sports like that. I grew up playing, and I, I may watch the Super Bowl or the championships or, or, or um, the World Series, but often I would incorporate sports in the lyrics, just like when I'm playing in the front. How you, I said, how you sound? Boy, you're better off a quitter. I'm on a mound, G, and this is no hitter. Yeah. And my DJ, the catcher, he's the man. He's the one who, who devised the plan. He throws the signs and hook up the beats with cloud. I throw the rhymes through the mic and I strike, strike them out. out. <laughs> you know, this is just a way of putting, putting words together where you can draw people in. That's outside of hip hop. So they just don't get this idea that hip hop is all ignorant and it's young and it's, and it's a whole bunch of stupidity because on the outer surface it, it, it seems that way because of the ignorance, the violence, the um, lack of originality. I usually say a lot of MCs, I think their imagination is sterile. That they don't try to produce anything. <laughs> you know, um, also insp I'm inspired by everything. I, I watch forensics a lot. You know, because it's, I'm not inspired by murder, so I'm going to take it that way. <laughs> but I'm inspired by the science of it and how they do solve things. How you find out. So it enables me to find something new to write about. Like, you know, because there's so much to grab from. Just like when we were in the lab today, you know, it's amazing to know that from one 